What personality type are you? What motivates your behavior? Discover the answers to these fascinating questions on Types, Your Personality Revealed. Hosted by personality experts Catherine and David Favre. Welcome to Types, Your Personality Revealed. This is our fifth show in our ongoing series exploring the Enneagram personality typing system. As you know, Catherine and I want to share the gifts of the Enneagram with as many people as possible. So in this show, we hosted a panel of master Enneagram teachers at a conference center in Long Beach, California to explore some of the most commonly asked questions by Enneagram enthusiasts. Our guest panelists are all master Enneagram teachers and have a great deal of wisdom and experience about the Enneagram and personal growth to share with you. They represent some of the Enneagram field's finest teachers, trainers, authors, and researchers. Our guest panelists from the U.S. are Dr. David Daniels, Russ Hudson, Tom Condon, Jerry Wagner, Dr. Deborah Uden, and from Denmark, Klaus Roger Olsen, and from Belgium, Sander de Klerk. Catherine and I feel honored they shared their time and wisdom with us and know you will greatly benefit from their guidance. Many of the Enneagram questions we will explore were submitted on our Enneagram Explorations Facebook fan page. These are the questions we'll be covering today. How can the Enneagram help us develop self-awareness? What are some tips for how to use the Enneagram for personal transformation? What are some tips for typing others? What are some tips for using the Enneagram in coaching or in business? Does Enneagram type come from nature or nurture? This was a fascinating and historic panel discussion and a great deal of fun. It was the first time we all answered these questions as a group and had the opportunity to share our viewpoints with one another. Our responses demonstrate a great unity among Enneagram teachers, revealing that most of us agree with one another most of the time. We all teach the Enneagram because we found the gifts of the Enneagram to be life-changing. And we all believe that understanding the Enneagram has made it possible to dramatically improve our relationships with loved ones, friends, and co-workers. In addition, our interactive discussion revealed helpful and effective ways to use the Enneagram to create positive and long-lasting change. And the first question we asked our panelists was how can the Enneagram help develop self-awareness? Our first question uh, is a simple one, but it's also a complicated one, and it's a, <coughs> one that's very often asked by people relatively new to the Enneagram. See this one online a lot, which is how can the Enneagram help us develop self-awareness? Now I realize we could answer this over several days, <laughs> but what we're looking for is some key tips for someone relatively new or they've been with the Enneagram for a few years on how can they use it for self-awareness? And whoever would like to begin. Okay. Yeah, oh, well, I think that from my perspective, the Enneagram works best when it's in combination with any kind of practice that cultivates mindfulness, presence, groundedness. What it does then, it rather than that presence or that awareness being like a vacation from our usual self, it brings that attention onto our usual self. The Enneagram helps us notice the particular ways we depart being self-aware. So um, I think the reason that it does that is rather than get caught up in all the little specific uh, tributaries and side streams and uh, little nudgy behaviors we all have, it gets right down to the, the core of it. What, what is the motivational core that causes us, uh, that not only generates these traits, but is also our primary way of departing a more direct contact with our experience here and now. I think it also teaches us how we can increasingly incorporate and harmonize our three fundamental intelligences. And there's a lot of the Enneagram, as we all know, about belly or body intelligence, heart or cognitive, or, or heart or emotional, and head or cognitive intelligence, and how they're all potentiated by presencing. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Russ. Would anyone else like to comment on Tom? Um, I, 
people come to it for different reasons at different times. It's possible sometimes for people to be exposed to the Enneagram and think, oh, well, that's, that's nothing much. And then at another point in time in their life, they return to it or mm -hmm. come across it again, and suddenly it hits them where they live. And when it does, there's a kind of shock to the system sometimes. But even after you begin to sort of absorb the implications of your own style and, and begin to uh, become aware of the way that you're seeing the world within your style and the way you're seeing yourself within your style and what motivates you, as you were saying. Um, there's also a pattern to it. You know, there's a patterned quality to the reactions that you start to notice. You start catching yourself in the act. You start realizing maybe that you are um, reacting into new situations in the same old way. Every time you come into a, a new situation, there's a kind of sense of deja vu. You start to also recognize how you might be maybe defending yourself in a way within the, uh, the point of view of the Enneagram style. And within this defense, there's a kind of uh, uh, series of, of questions and a, uh, a direction that can lead you mm -hmm. to beginning to understand and observe yourself more and also unravel old knots that you might have tied in your personal history and kind of mm, old layers and things that you hung on to that once made you uh, uh, safe or secure or kept you out of pain or uh, whatever your particular defenses were. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tom. Sandra? Uh, I also think that it's important to see the other types and not mm -hmm. only your own type. And seeing that there are eight other types and is kind, was kind of opening a new world to me. And it's like, oh, that's another way of, another possibility of, uh, to act in a mm -hmm. situation. So for me, it's more about looking at the nine types and what can we learn from all of them. Mm -hmm. And I agree with what you're saying. It, it's all about present, and it starts at your own type. But <coughs> for me, it's like, what do I have to learn from the nine types? Mm -hmm. And my, my tip would be that uh, you have the opportunity to see each other with fresh eyes, new eyes, and see how you're similar, how you're different, and making all of it okay, as opposed to judging one behavior is different than another. I had one son that was a type six, another that was a type eight. The parenting was very different. And what was successful for the six was not for the eight and vice versa. I'd like to follow up on, on you mentioned the eyes. A metaphor I like is uh, lenses. And um, so we all look at the world through lenses um, but forget we're looking at the world through lenses. And I find that the Enneagram is helpful because it kind of takes off the lens and actually looks at the lens. Mm -hmm. And then you find out, well, there are nine different lenses and some of them are different from mine and I could probably you know, use David's gl glasses and see things differently. And so the Enneagram is kind of like a psychic ophthalmologist, I guess, or an optometrist, you know. It kind of it actually lets you see the particular um, uh, framework that you look at the world through. I would just add to that that it's a, in order to really see the lenses, you have to be able to have this acceptance we were talking about, this kind of grounded presence so that you can develop a good self-observer to be able to observe the patterns. Mm -hmm. But then it requires something else, which we call acceptance, which means being able to open your heart to yourself mm -hmm. and others doesn't mean you agree or capitulate with something right. because you're going to find a lot of things that are both positive and some things that are not so positive about yourself and others and we need to have some compassion about that so it's very important you have both the awareness and the grounded presence and this acceptance so that you have your heart open to yourself and others okay. then you can do the work of understanding the Enneagram and compassion yeah. for ourselves, too, because that's one of the hardest things. When I first learned about the Enneagram, I remember going and apologizing to everybody because I, I couldn't understand why they weren't seeing the world the way I did. You know, I think it's true. I think the awareness, David, that you're talking about and the acceptance, but I think what's really great about the Enneagram is it gives us a map. It tells us mm -hmm. what the patterns are. It lays it out for us. Mm -hmm. It helps us to identify it. We call that, it, you know, it gives us a insight into our patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. And when we have that map, then we can use that to start to uncover and to de yeah. deep dive into the work for ourselves. 
What I really like is that, that when people learn about the typology, the, the next question that occurs is, what can I then do? Mm -hmm. So now I know I'm introvert or extrovert or whatever typing system can tell me, but the next part that I find very powerful is that the anchor actually provides you with the tool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, it, it, it not, doesn't only give you the box, mm -hmm. it gives you the key to the box. And mm -hmm. I fully agree with what David said that I often say to people, it's not all you will hear about your type you will like. like there, there will be part of you that, so, so I see myself mm -hmm. a, as one kind, but, and you, I see myself yeah. through some lenses, but people look at me with a different kind of lenses. And, and to realize that, that I, I thought it was humor, but people find me blunt, that was, that was a major sh um, eye opener in the early, <laughs> when I started the session, I still did it actually. Uh, but but it, it, it came, that's, I think that's the most powerful thing that, that is not only describing, but then the what to do things. I, I really like that. Yeah. And one thing I'd just add that weaves together some of the things that we've been talking about is that I think one thing that happens if you really get into it and really see how we actually are like these patterns it has a, there's a process of a kind of cracking open where we see how narrowly we've been perceiving ourselves in others yeah. and it part of it is as you were saying Catherine is that seeing other people's perspectives but then in that process I also start to make friends with parts of me I didn't even know I had mm -hmm. so it start opens up the whole sense of what our self is and what our potentials and possibilities are I think for a lot of people, that's the most exciting and hopeful mm -hmm. part of it. Mm -hmm. I would just add, I, I've always had an interest in Eastern philosophies, and particularly if you look at like Advaita or any of the Eastern philosophies, there's this common idea of developing this inner self-observer. Mm -hmm. And the thing that always astounded me with the Enneagram is that it fundamentally maps out what this observer is not. So when we see those patterns, <laughs> we realize that we're observing them and that isn't who we are. And that I found that that transformational piece alone, simply if you got that, that if you can see what's happening, that it started this kind of permanent ongoing process of developing this self-awareness, yeah. this process of actually seeing myself from a perspective that wasn't just in my type and I'm a four and I just, this is just what I do. So, yeah, you know, and, and with that, um, you know, I think the, another important thing is that it lets us see the other, the other lenses, mm -hmm. as you were saying, Jerry. And mm -hmm. it's like, and by seeing that, then we can start to believe that we're not separate, and we can start to look at other people and see our similarities rather than our dissimilarities. Mm -hmm. And with that, it helps us to bring, you know, more consciousness to our interactions and to the whole, mm -hmm. and it allows us for more of a unitive experience. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that... Um, our producer wanted us to ask is how knowing the Enneagram can help facilitate peace and if we look at it in terms of this level of compassion yeah. and seeing the other person's point of view it can dr dramatically improve relationships with uh, at home at work in our communities and then therefore the world at large it saved a lot of marriages yeah. yeah, tell me and, about it. And the way it does that is uh, it, it, we, in relationships where people have a basic connection, but mm -hmm. there's aspects of each other's behavior that drive the other crazy. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you realize your Enneagram style and you're able to sort of step, and the other person, you realize the other person's Enneagram style, step inside their shoes and there is a, uh, you, 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 you stop taking their behavior so personally yeah. and you realize that the thing that they're doing that drives you crazy is sincerely motivated out of their vision of the world and what yeah. they think is necessary in order to survive and take care of themselves. Yeah. And they cease becoming a, a shadow in a dark sense. You know, in a, uh, you know they cease becoming other mm -hmm. in the way that you're talking about. Yeah. There are nine views of reality all of which are inherently valuable. The gifts of the Enneagram are that we understand one another and ourselves and can develop compassion. The strengths are many. The wisdom of the Enneagram is seeing these differences and recognizing that there's personality diversity. And the strength also represents like a fundamental core as mentioned by the teachers that motivational issue, not what we do, but why we do what we do, which is why I find the Enneagram so critical 
and so helpful in developing critical self-awareness. I agree with everyone's answers and the Enneagram, what I love about it is that on one level it's this incredibly complex and rich system showing motivation. And, but we can also answer this question very simply, which is that to develop self-awareness, if all someone does is that they accurately determine their instinct, their type, and their tri-type, it starts this chain reaction of self-awareness. And my experience is that once that happens and it lands for someone, that they're really never the same, that that self-observation just continues onward. That's so accurate. Everyone reports that they can never see themselves or others in the same way again. The next question we asked our panelists was, what are some tips on how to use the Enneagram for personal transformation? So a follow-up question, which is very intentionally close to the first one I asked. So assuming that when we first learn our type, there's this self-awareness aha that happens. Then the next question that people will often ask is, okay, what do I do now? And so the question, which overlaps, but in some ways I think it's actually different because it implies some type of action, is what are some tips on how to use the Enneagram for personal transformation? So we know that it can be used for self-awareness and there is that immediate self-awareness that comes from just learning your type, which I think we've all talked about in different ways. But what is some advice if you were talking to someone relatively new to the system, a few years in, is how can they use it for personal transformation? And I think in terms of, uh, a tip you would give, um, you know, someone that's not new, new to the Enneagram, but, you know, relatively new. We get this question a lot, and I imagine you do too. So I've got that self-awareness, I get it, I'm a four. How do I use it for transformation? I have a saying I just made up, and I want to try it out. <laughs> what I notice, I am not. What I don't notice, I am. So the tip is, to step back a little bit and if you can notice your style that's your inner observer and so it's saying well I see this part of me so that mustn't be all of me or me right, right. but if I'm so <laughs> <laughs> if I'm so close to my pattern I can't see it then I'm identified with it so I know to steal a line from Tom there you know be easy in your harness step back a little bit and get a little distance between you and your style. And, and don't be afraid to do that. So yeah, yeah. my tip. And at times you can, you can even have your observer in collusion too. So mm. stepping back mm. helps you have more clarity overall. I totally agree. Yeah, for me, I think the biggest tip I can give is get a community. Mm -hmm. And whatever that community looks like, um, hopefully there's somebody in there who can be a teacher and to be a guide, a helper. Um, but, you know, it's so hard for us sometimes mm -hmm. to see, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and other people seem to see us very well. Mm -hmm. And if you have a community that is loving and trusting and very connected, then they can give you the feedback and you can take it in and you can really bring it down into yourself. If you get that feedback over and over that you're blunt, sometimes it kind of <laughs> goes in. Yeah. It might <laughs> be just a little bit true. <laughs> it did. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and I especially like all the inner connection that there is in the Enneagram, all the, yeah. that you can look at your wing, and you can look at the, the opposite wing, and you can look at the type you can't see. That I don't see that much nine in me, for example, so it must be there somewhere. So, so <laughs> looking for the pieces I can't see, I like the idea, I often say to people, it's about dare to look, and look again, and look again, and look again, and eventually ask yourself, why do I do it? What is... And we do a lot of things, certainly I do, I do a lot of things that give bad results. Or why, why do we end here all the time? Mm -hmm. Pe people often say to me that they think they become more clever the older they become. I, I don't see that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, do, we do the same mistake over and over again. We we <laughs> we get <laughs> it, we get better at believing we're right. clever. <laughs> okay, I look forward to be uh, mature. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what I was thinking is that what I always say when people learn about the Enneagram and they see the patterns and they see that the kind of dark sides of themselves and it's like, whoa, I don't want to be that. So I think it's it's very important to tell them to be kind to themselves mm -hmm. and be curious about the patterns. Like just observe it, be curious about it. Like why am I doing it? 
because I believe there's always a good intention. You're always trying to protect something mm -hmm. or you need something or yeah. just know that it, it was helpful. And it's just maybe it's time to let go of it and try something new and expand. But I think that's very important because mm -hmm. some of uh, some of the people I coach, when they learn about it, they kind of get very critical, like, oh, my God, is this my type? Mm -hmm. So I think that's very crucial. And they can use their type to be unkind to themselves. Right. And yeah. so that's, yes. a, that's a really yeah. good yeah, point. Yeah, self-compassion. Uh, I want to add to the, the, the path of the development. Uh, we do need this incredible business to be aware and to be compassionate. But what the Enneagram also gives us, it tells us what goes right down to the core, the core beliefs, the things that are driving us from the inside, that were formed in our early childhood, in our patterns, so we can come to realize these, we can come to understand these. And when you do that, it gives you huge leverage, because you're getting right to the fundamental beliefs to get to liberation. Mm -hmm. And the Enneagram is basically a liberation psychology. It's about getting these patterns so you can get out of those patterns, you can get the freedom. And like Jerry was saying, there's all we don't see, that's a huge amount of the world. And when we can now be liberated from this constraint, we can see all these other possibilities. It's huge. Um, it, it also shows you your defenses, which is another way of kind of um, um, phrasing what you just said, David. I, th I think, and it shows you old fixed stances that you took that were adaptive early in life, ways you dug in your heels, ways you sort of protected yourself or uh, created a sort of defensive structure and set of patterns in a way that was perfectly appropriate to those circumstances. Really worked well at one point in time, and now it's sort of like we're attached to doing what used to work. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when that begins to come apart, and sometimes you have to sort of get at the emotional core of maintaining a fixed stance like that, then y it, uh, you really begin to have something. Mm -hmm. It's not always comfortable, but one of the nice things about the Enneagram is it shows you both your dark shadows and your light shadows. It shows right. you all kinds of potentials. Mm -hmm. all kind of, there's all kinds of resources. There's a high side to your central Enneagram style and your connection to a bunch of other Enneagram styles mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of other distinctions with the model that are good news. Matt, yeah, Russ. Yeah, I was just listening to everybody. It's, um, I, I just resonating with everything everybody said and this theme that's emerging. Um, I think that one of the great benefits that happens is not only as we're seeing, seeing the, the pattern we're stuck in that's causing us so much misery, but also glimpses of what we are on a deeper level. Um, so, there's a couple things about that. One is that if you're going to grow from this, you need practice. And what kind of practice? A practice that you'll do. And, and David and I were just uh, teaching a, a program together uh, where we're looking at how the Enneagram shows us not just the issues of our type, but particular imbalances that we I get identified with. Mm -hmm. That that Im imbalance feels like me. But as we get more, as we do even little practices, we start to see that imbalance is not me, just like we're all seeing. We feel it as an imbalance. And so the Enneagram is a way of recognizing these imbalances and finding the ingredient, be it kinesthetic, emotional, cognitive, or a particular perspective that will bring balance. And I also agree with what Deborah was saying that we need help. We can't do it alone community, teachers, and I would just say about that, it isn't much of a community and it's not much of a teacher if they can only tell us what's wrong with us. No, that's and true. it's also not much of a teacher if they can only flatter us and make yeah. us feel right. like, yeah. you know, you need someone who can help you see your difficulties and mirror to you the glory of who and what you are. Yeah, absolutely. And, support you. Yeah, I find that, you know, the ego strengthening using the Enneagram can be just yeah. as critical right. as trying yes. to see what you're doing that's a problem. Yes. Um, because you're not going to, at least in my experience, my view is that ICS is being born a type and I'm going to be that type until I die. So I need to make friends with it and I can't get rid of it. So and I think it's, it's there for a reason. I just want to be able to express it as, as much health and, as I can. So anyone else on this question of using the Enneagram for transformation tips or David? Well, just that it's this huge, again, it's a liberation psychology. When you're owned by, the, by your habit of mind, by your type pattern, there isn't much freedom. And when, when, you, when you 
no longer owned by it, when it's, when it's not there, preoccupying, it gives, you, it gives you lots of room for creativity, for joy, for pleasure, for relationship that, that wasn't there. So it's, it's a great path to freedom. Part of the good news is that there's a high side to each style mm -hmm. and that there are natural talents and intrinsic resources that are there that come much more easily to you within your style than to others within their styles. They have, they have something else going on. And also, as people grow and change, they begin to wear their style much more lightly, mm -hmm. which uh, that's a phrase I like for mm -hmm. sort of describing it because your, your perceptions are you're still shaped a certain way but it's almost like you, they're drained of their defensive intensity and you're otherwise quite uh, open and a lot more of you is in the present than once was. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also see it too as a social role, a biological imperative, that each Enneagram type is addressing something really critical and important that any family, tribe, business, community needs. Mm -hmm. and wearing it lightly is recognizing that the sixes are meant to let us know what can go wrong and the fours are supposed to let us know what's missing and the eights are meant to call off what's vulnerable weak and in need of uh, reinforcement and the fives are meant to inform us and and on and on that each enneagram type each tri type each instinct has a critical piece that they're bringing and once it's not as defensive and light as you say, we can hear it. We can enjoy that uh, information. We can benefit from it in a more uh, pleasurable way. Another thing I want to add is that I think it's critical as if people haven't done that much of Enneagram training, I see a tendency to reduce themselves to a type. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's yeah, critical to say that you are much more than your Enneagram type and it's just a model and it's always a means to an end it's a means for it's a tool for personal growth mm -hmm. and it can't be just a goal to say oh I want to I want to have a number mm -hmm. that's not the goal so I think or that's not a have a number yeah yeah, yeah exactly yeah um, so I think that's also important don't reduce yourself mm -hmm. yeah, I agree Sandra I mean, after all it, it, it is just a model if a very powerful model, but we don't want a mistake that it can fully describe someone, you know, it's, what it's describing I think is a, a liberation and a, a revelation, but it is ultimately a model that we keep moving forward, you know, that keeps getting better. Could I, could I add that, uh, to me it's like a nationality, it's sort of like a psychological nationality, so if I sit down next to Sandra and I say, I'm Tom, I'm an American, what do you know about me really? you know maybe that I'm over-identified with <laughs> And then we have, a, we have the, a something that happens with the Enneagram that I call educated bigotry. <laughs> but there is a, a, an over-identification. If I over-identified with being an American, I said, well, you're foreign. You're from, uh, what, what, the country of Europe, did you say? Yeah. <laughs> um, there would be a way in which I'm kind of over, you know, stuck within my worldview, seeing other people as other than me. Mm -hmm. And as, I, as you grow and change, as people come out of it and work with their Enneagram style, kind of snap out of the trance of it, mm -hmm. it's rather like uh, becoming a citizen of the world, mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. And rather like wearing your nationality lightly. You know, you know, I know I'm an American, but I've actually heard of foreign countries. Yeah. <laughs> You've heard of yeah. Belgium. Yeah. yeah, and Belgian people and things like that. Speaking and of the Danish people, I've yeah. heard of them. Yeah. Klaus, did you want to follow? Yeah, I, I, I have the fortune of being a student of many of these people, and mm -hmm. uh, Russ once said that the Enneagram is not about putting you in boxes, it's about to get you out of the box you're in. And I like that idea very much, and I use it every, almost every day when I tr train people that now we know you are for congratulations. <laughs> now, now the tough part starts. And, and, and I think it's very important that, that what I think we need more on the planet now is that we can forgive each other. I say you, you cannot use your Enneagram style as your life excuse. I do this because I am a type X, Y, Z. But what I came to tell people that it's okay you use it f for their excuse. Oh, that person could be a type five. So the reason why that person does that is therefore, and therefore I can forgive them. So I can see them, I, I can wear my own style lighter, mm -hmm. and I can see they, their style 
I know what's behind. I know, mm -hmm. I know you did that, but, but I can forgive you because I understand more that mm -hmm. you probably want you to know. There it was. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a little hung up on my metaphor of lenses, and I also want to steal some stuff from David and Helen Palmer. Helen's is, uh, line is that we all, each of the types has an intuitive edge, that they see things mm -hmm. before other people see it. They, they, they see things clearer be, before other people see them. So we're talking about the high side of the style. So each of the styles sees things very clearly. And like if you want to see things from a 360 degree point of view, you need all nine styles to see things. So I'm, I'm sitting here, and man, I'm an expert on that particular wall over there. You want to know about that wall? Ask me, because I really see it clearer. I don't have a clue what's behind me right now. I got a big blind spot back there. But if I got some type sitting over there, <clears throat> they can tell me what's back there. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, each of the styles has adaptive schemas as well as maladaptive ones. So, you know, mm -hmm. those are things that we kind of share with our kids. Like, here's a good way to live. Mm -hmm. Here's a good way to look at this. Here's a good way to think about this. So um, there really are some, some contributions that each style makes to the human well, picture, like you were saying with the families. Yeah. As you can all see, having a sense of humor about this is extraordinarily helpful. And I would say that it's a really important tip to not personalize what feels so personal, to remember that so much of the time the way we're thinking, feeling, or behaving is a function of a defense strategy and not who we are. We can work with this on a serious level alone. We can study, we can gather as much information as possible, and we can become more aware. But if we really want to work on this information, we do it in partnership because it's our partners who mirror back to us our strengths, our weaknesses, and they see us in a way that we don't see ourselves. And to work at an even greater level, as Deborah mentioned, is to work in community. And in community, we're getting that additional level of feedback. So if we do all three, we're able to develop greater compassion for ourselves and for others. I, I agree, and one of the things that I've found, having studied self-help and psychology for over 20 years, is that most of what you're taught, for example, when I was in psych school, it's a one-size-fits-all model. Right. And it can be helpful, but with the Enneagram, the magic of transformation happens because you actually get tips and techniques and methods to work specifically with your own ego structures. Okay. And each of these master Enneagram teachers has developed a lot of those. And I would encourage anyone watching this to explore their work, to know specifically how to do transformational work with their own type. And the last piece I would just add is that it's very common for us, and I'm sure every teacher on this panel, to hear people who've been in therapy or done self-help work for years and years and years, and they do a couple coaching sessions with the Enneagram, and they feel that they've learned more than oh, they did before. So true. Time and time again, people have told me that they've learned more in the first three-hour session than they've learned in many years. I agree. Next, we asked our panelists one of the most commonly asked questions, <laughs> but it's also one of the most controversial. And the question was, what are some tips on how to determine the Enneagram type of others? We're going to go to another question, which is a Facebook question. And I'm going to predict that none of you are going to like that I'm going to ask it. But <laughs> you've been asked it a lot. Yeah. And it's an important one to address. And it's very simple. What are some tips for typing others? Because we know that everyone wants to type their family. If they get excited about the Enneagram, they want to type their friends. So you may have opinions about whether people should even do that or not, or if they try to do it, how they should do it. So we just want to know what you would say to someone Again, who's an enthusiast, they love using the system. It could be practical, like pay attention to this. Uh, it could be whatever you want. But the question that came up on Facebook a lot was, what are tips for typing other people? One short, very short statement to kick it off. Okay. I think doing it without that person's consent or involvement mm -hmm. is usually a bad idea if you value you your well. friendship <laughs> yeah. with that person. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Don't. <laughs> um, Don't actually, type. 
I wrote a book about how to see it in the movies, yeah. and that way you don't insult movie characters. <laughs> you know, you can sort of watch it at leisure and practice that way. And having, I think, and having said, don't type others, you know, without permission. I think the other thing to do is really have a deep study. Attend one of the schools. Study with any of the number of us who have schools, and uh, learn a good typing process. Uh, you know, we teach our students. I was taught by David and Helen, and we teach the same, same strategy, which is to develop a set of questions that you use continuously across everyone that you, that you interview, and do a, a typing interview uh, with their consent in about an hour. And then, then I, I still say, don't give them one type. Give them two. Give them two to choose from. I think that's really essential. I think it's necessary that we don't type people. They type themselves. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, continually remember what you don't know, uh, you know, and, mm -hmm. and stay open as long as possible until something really strikes you with certainty rather than grasping at premature t certainty because people get type happy with this thing. <laughs> too, and you too. think you have people in a nutshell, but all you have is a nutshell. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah. Think, I think uh, we all have that question. And my sister reads a lot of books. She, pro she must be a five or my boss got a new car and he's bragging about his new car. He must be a three. And say, no, he's a guy. He's a guy. He's a guy. So, 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 so look behind the behavior. And, and, and that's yeah. really the most important thing. Of course, behavior reveals a part of it, yeah. but, but it doesn't reveal it all. So, so, so he's sad. He must be a four. No, he's sad. Mm -hmm. so, so, so look behind and, and be curious. Uh, uh, and if you, I think if you too rapidly say this is a type two, play with the idea that, that it's not. Just to, to be curious that something else could be there. Also, it's not the Olympics. There's no yeah. hurry. <laughs> no, right. we're, we're yeah. yeah, there's no hurry. Yeah. Well, I wanted to add something really fundamental, which is there's a lot of typologies out there, and they don't have very much predictive value because they're too much about external behaviors. Right. And what the Enneagram is all about is the internal structure of reality. And so it's really, really important to help people get to their own internal structure of reality. It's also part of the path of liberation and becoming really aware. Mm -hmm. But it's more fundamental than that. It's that, that it's very difficult with really great accuracy to type from the outside. Mm -hmm. And I like to go, even if I could do it like 99% of the time, I don't think that's a good favor. Because I think what's really important for people, and I can't do it 99% of the time, <laughs> believe me, but it's, it's not a favor because they need to discover for themselves, Absolutely. what is this? What's really, what's really driving me? What's motivating me? And that's what makes the difference. Yeah, we believe guidance is really helpful, but that the person has to get there on their own and continue to uh, do the deep inquiry and exploration. We can help them get at what's underneath it, but then the journey is their own personal. Yeah, I would just pick up on what Catherine's saying, is that as someone who has admittedly been completely obsessed with typing other people from the mm -hmm. beginning, um, I, even after going through uh, full certifications and multiple programs, I was terrible at it. So I can say that it's a very difficult thing to do, <laughs> as David says. And I would suggest a few things, because I think it's sort of like a taboo that people are going to, they do it whether we suggest they do or don't. Um, I think the biggest thing not to do is what I think you said, Ross, which is, or Tom, which is don't go tell them what you think without their permission. Realize that you very likely in the beginning are, are incorrect. And the third thing I would say is that the system, at least as I experience it, is fundamentally about motivation and not behavior, which is why what Klaus is saying, you can't type by behavior, and that's the biggest error I see is that people are trying to type by behavior clusters and it doesn't work. And that's why with our research, we've been fascinated by looking at things that are a little bit more uh, indicative or definitive, which are things like language use or micro expressions or body types. But to even be able to use those tools takes a long time and a lot of study and a lot of integrity. So um, that's my, my feeling on it. Anybody else? I think, just, just to follow up on that, if, if we get real about this, which I'm sure my eight uh, <laughs> fellow panelists would say, you better get real. When you first learn something, you're just going to try it out. 
right? Mm -hmm. You're gonna practice yeah. it, you're gonna use it. So we could say don't do it, but you're, we're gonna do it anyway. Yeah. It's like the mind looks for patterns, it looks for regularities, and mm -hmm. now it says, oh, wow, here's something else that I yeah. can f yeah. you know, find patterns with. But then after, you know, the <laughs> fun wears off, and you realize, wow, well, there's a lot more to this person than the, you know, the eggshell mm -hmm. or whatever, yeah, whatever that nutshell. metaphor, or nutshell. nutshell. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Hopefully there's a nut in there. Or, you know, if, <laughs> if they go to your Generally program, is. they're going to yeah. say, oh my God, now i got to pay attention to not only the core style and the motivation, but what about the wings? What about the instincts? What about the facial characteristics? What about the archetypes? What about, you know, what kind of candy they like? There's, <laughs> there's a lot of nuances right. yeah. um, that you realize only after you, you know, right. typed exactly. with abandon and then you say, oh, there's more to this than I thought. Yeah. I agree completely, Jerry. Yeah. I was just say that to, to piggyback on all of this, uh, I find that even if we are correct, and let's say I, my friend David and I go say, hey David, you're a, a four, and I may even be right. Is, is this really to what uh, David was saying, that it's sort of like giving people the Harry Potter books and telling them the ending of the story. Right. You've ripped them off really <laughs> badly because the whole thing was designed mm. to initiate a process of self-discovery. If you give people the punchline, now they've got another label for their head and they have not taken the journey. Mm -hmm. And you've ripped them off. If your friend wants to know their type, it's a really cool thing to talk about them, to observe them, to interview them, to explore it with them. That's, that's awesome. And vis-a-vis -vis even movie characters and famous people, we're drawing that stuff. We don't know what they really are. We're giving them as sort of the, the face they present to the world represents something that people can relate to, might help them learn the types. But I think that um, the whole reason we learn it is for a growth process. And when people are really stuck, I've, I've sat, I've talked with them, tried to explain it over and over, and they're still confused. I said, look, in the end, it's all, a, it's all a metaphor. And what I want you to find is the type that will most help you grow and wake up. That's the right one. Mm -hmm. If you think you're a four and melancholy doesn't mean that much to you and you can't relate to it, then it, being a four will not help you. Mm -hmm. So what will help you awaken? That's my question. Uh, no, I was waiting for you. What I just wanted to add is that um, I often say in business, because they ask, okay, but I want to I wanna know what my employees are so I can help them better. And then I always answer, well, it's good to think about it, what the type is, but don't tell them. And know that it's an, a, an hypothesis. And in a way, it expands your way of seeing them. So in, if they use it like that, I don't mind that they're thinking about what type would it be. So I think there's nuances. Don't it's Don't ever stop listening. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And always know that it's just an idea. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, well, just a second. Basically what you've been saying, what Russ was saying, is so the, the importance of getting type is it gives you this huge leverage to work with yourself yeah. and to change yourself and to develop yourself. So the process of getting it needs to start from within, not from the outside, just like Russ was saying. The purpose of getting type is so that you have an ability ability to really efficiently, effectively work with your own stuff and to become a more whole human being. Uh, also, you know, there's a saying, when two people do the same thing, it's not the same thing at all. That's true. You know, which is another way to yes. piggyback on what everyone is saying. Uh, it's what motivates a behavior. In other words, uh, style number seven in the Enneagram. I've known a number of sevens who eat fast. And it kind of corresponds with the description of the style. When seven get anxious, they're prone to gluttony, and sometimes that'll come out and be expressed in how they actually eat. Mm -hmm. I've also known people who eat fast who came from large families. <laughs> <laughs> and there weren't enough tacos. And there weren't enough tacos, <laughs> and you had to grab, and you had to eat fast and get yours first. And you just don't know sometimes until you do know <laughs> what, the, what the internal motivation is. And you can't identify it from the traits. You can't identify it from the external, the external behavior. You don't, what, what you have is a clue. An amazing, very astute answers from all the teachers. And actually, typing is near and dear to our hearts. We've spent many, many years 
researching and trying to understand ways to teach this material so that people can more accurately type themselves and others. In fact, we've begun narrowing it down to a 12-point system of typing. What to look for? What's in the expressions, the micro-movements, the gestures? Whether they're the physical gestures or the tiny little movements around the mouth. How the body is carried, the way the person speaks, how loud, how soft, how quickly, how slowly. What are the words they use, the lexicon of type? Do they talk about being happy or sad? Are they melancholic in their approach? Are they more um, theoretical? Are they more detached? All of these are important, as well as the visual archetype. What does someone look like? We really look at so many factors to help people assess type and more accurately type themselves and others. I agree. I mean, what's critical is here we have a system where we have to determine someone's type. Right. So it's important to develop that skill, and it's not always a quick or easy skill to develop. And I agree with the panelists. It's not helpful to tell people what type you think they yeah. are. Um, it's helpful to help guide them. Um, the real growth is seeing the type inside yourself. That said, uh, as you and I do a lot of work in typing, we post on our Facebook fan page about celebrities and how to type them. And when we do that, we're really looking at, at the keys that you said. Um, your research that you did in the 90s that established that each type actually speaks in its own identifiable language pattern. Yeah. That's amazing. And you can type people based off of that quite accurately. But I think in general, it's uh, an ongoing study, and it's learning how to assess, like being a tracker or hunter out in the jungle or something. Mm -hmm. You know, at first it seems difficult, and after a while you pick up the signs pretty quick. And there are key words. I mean, lexicon is probably one of the most important factors that we feel you c should consider. In fact, last night I just posted on our fan page who uses the word uh, gaudy. And it, any of us could potentially use it, but if we put it into the context of a question, like I avoid gaudy clothing, gaudy attire, there's only one type that uses that word in that context after almost 20,000, 25,000 uh, any style questionnaires, and that's type four. And that's the sort of thing that we can begin to understand, not just what it looks like on the outside to um, see a four, but what the fours themselves say and the other eight Enneagram types. So we really feel that that's critically important, as well as kind of the themes that people tend to use can be indicative of type as well. I agree, and our next question that we asked was what are some tips on how to use the Enneagram in coaching and in business? So our next question is a little easier, <laughs> a little bit uh, less provocative. Um, a lot of people want to use the Enneagram in either coaching or business, and we have many people here on the panel who have done it with thousands and thousands of people, either in businesses or coaching. So what are some tips that you would give to someone, either in coaching or that want to teach the Enneagram in a business, as to what you found works? I think it's really important to translate a lot of the things that we use in the Enneagram community. I, can, I teach the Enneagram differently in an open training where people sign up and they really want to do self-development. But if you step into a team and the team is just, they didn't choose themselves yeah, to be there. Yeah. So it's totally different. And I noticed that if I talk about healthy average and unhealthy levels, for example, they're kind of, I don't want to be average. Although we know it's 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 good. It's the average. Yeah. It's very so good. <laughs> but they are like, no, I don't want to be average. So I, I start using they're at their best or they're on automatic pilot or they're in trouble. And then it's okay for them. Like, okay, I have an automatic pilot. I, mm -hmm. Sometimes I say, oops, I did it again. <laughs> and that's what they recognize. Uh, otherwise, you get resistance and um, then it's oh, too that's, negative. That's such a great point because a lot of times teams do choose. But it's often the company that's saying we want to go this direction and I've worked with different groups where there was such a resistance and one particular company it was voluntary to attend and there were several people that were really anxious and didn't want to be typecast or labeled which is another really important point we don't ever <laughs> want to do that but over time they saw that more and more and more people 
understood their type and themselves and one another and they wanted to. Now for some people that took 10 years. One company I've been teaching in for uh, 12 years and a couple years ago one person said, you know, I was so against this and because it was open in this case, they finally just came on their own and then they were the person that ended up telling everyone else, you've got to go. I was a naysayer and I wish I'd gone early on. But you're so right, Sandra. If you're there because you have to or it's expected, it's a totally different ball game than when someone's choosing and seeking out this information. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies and Prim primarily what I do is I go in and I get the landscape. We do an assessment basically with whoever's bringing us in. And then from there we, um, we start to individually, sometimes individually, mostly individually, um, type. Uh, do a typing interview with uh, the individuals on the team. Sometimes people don't have the funds for that and so what we do is a group typing. While we're doing the group typing, we're teaching the Enneagram. And we have you know, our cards and so forth and our products that we u utilize. And people, what happens is people start to really, st oh hey, are you really a five? Or maybe you're a, you know, they start mm -hmm. interacting and it increases the amount of, of uh, awareness that the team has. It also you know, builds the team. We focus on things like uh, communication, feedback, you know, and we're, con we're most often brought in for conflict. Mm -hmm. And so we can use this tool, but first and foremost, we have to teach it. And once we get some buy-in, I mean, th other people have talked about no buy-in, but once we get buy-in, uh, I think it's a, a wonderful tool. The other thing that is essential for me and my company, we don't do a one-shot deal. You're buying us for a relationship. And that relationship is an ongoing relationship because to just go in and teach this incredibly powerful tool and not go back, mm -hmm. I think that's kind of not, not the I best. Mean, my experience very early was that in a business, you can't just go in and do it for a day and a half and right. leave. That they've got to have some coaching on top of that and then they need some reinforcement, like you said, the community early on mm -hmm. so that it grows. This is a process. And that uh, it's, you know, having worked in a lot of companies, I find that they'll bring these different systems in and the, the employee learns it and it gets dropped very quickly. But this ongoing support seems to be key. Yeah. In integration. I think it's very important to speak the language that they speak. Mm -hmm. So you, we don't enforce the Enneagram on them. We, we start where they are. So if, if it's a corporate world, you have to <laughs> speak the language of a corporate world. Mm -hmm. So they therefore earn money and, and start there. They don't know what we know, so so we can. I, I've done. I've done it. I can't tell you how many times I'm starting a, telling salespeople about the Enneagram as a sales tool, and eventually they ask question about. I think my daughter is her four. What mm -hmm. should I do? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a problem with my wife. Uh, so so they they're human beings. Mm -hmm. They're just there for the sales part, but t speak the language they understand, and eventually they will ask, and they will be curious, and mm -hmm. they will ask, can can we go further with this? <laughs> Yes, we can. Yes, we <laughs> sure can. <laughs> Something I found to be very true is that don't force it on them. And as Tom often said, there's a, there's a time and place. It can be, a, I'm not ready now. It can be, you say something to me now that I, 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 I said, that's not me. But eventually mm -hmm. it, it awakens something in me. And it can be that two years later, one, five years later, ten years later, mm -hmm. I come saying, oh, didn't I hear something about something type? I think it's, it's now. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm on my fifth marriage, I, perhaps I should <laughs> try now to, to listen. So I like the time and place and don't enforce it. Yeah. We, and I, I love the endnote speaker we had on this conference that what's the common value in this room? I like that because we all want to have a l happy life. Mm -hmm. We all want happy relationship. I just want to add that uh, we've been talking about coaching. I mean, it's extremely useful in all relationships. Mm -hmm. Life is about relationships. We don't thrive. We don't live without relationships. We get this basic emotion of distress that all mammals have if we don't have relationships. So it's really valuable in psychotherapy and couples counseling. I love doing I'm a therapist of background. I love doing the Enneagram work with couples because it's all about relationship. And it's all about these misunderstandings. And they're not... And 
And so that work with couples, and our work, of course, as coaches and therapists, is like, well, it's all about the interpersonal relationships, too. You know, like, what's our emotional intelligence and helping people with that? So it's just huge in all human endeavors, but particularly coaching and therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I uh, really like about working in business contexts is presenting the Enneagram, maybe doing individual coaching as a kind of follow-up, depending on the situation and what the people's needs are. But the sort of spillover effect that we're all kind of alluding to, where the person gets, uh, they improve on the job, they fulfill some professional goals, but the real thing they tell you later that they're really happy about or excited about is, I finally understood my teenage daughter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or I resolved this conflict that has vexed me in my personal life as a kind of uh, value yeah. added, you know, as a kind of accidental, incidental. Yeah. And uh, those things to me are not incidental. They're actually no. sort of primary. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And the experience that I've had in businesses is that invariably the unhappy, the unhappy employee was very often the odd man out enneagrammatically somehow in their team yeah. system, particularly if it was a company where they had to work with a certain team for a long period of time. So if you had a team where they were, for example, all social instincts and you had one uh, intimate sexual instinct, that person would often not feel like th they were getting what they needed. And I've seen the opposite too. We worked at a company that was run by probably a self-preservation instinct founder and the, all the values and the perks in the company were all, all self-pres, like vacations, money, and the socials there were miserable because nobody was honoring them in terms of that. So I found that can be critical to get the team to work better. Yeah. It's just to look at it and know what's going on. Um, it becomes quite obvious when you know what styles people have or their Enneagram types. Mm -hmm. Sandra? What I also wanted to add is if you're working with a team, what I do is they need, and, and in business, they need practical use. So. I teach them like, okay, what is the communication style of the types or the conflict style? Things that, that are practical and yes. that they can do in a few days and they don't want to hear about themselves alone or the types or the theory, they want to work with it. And that's, that's your way in and um, that helps. And then as a team coach, when I'm working with a team, it's, it helps me like when, when a type one says something then I say, okay, now I have to look at the sevens and you see them like, mm, mm, mm. And it, it's, it's so predictable. You see the patterns and you see like, whoa, if that's the constellation of the team, mm, that, that must be hard to be in that position. Or those types are, are not uh, in the team. Okay, what does that say about the team? It's, it's, it's amazing what it brings. And I think in, in individual coaching, I would add that it helps me to see that you can't coach every person with the same technique. You have to adapt Absolutely. your technique to the type. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if you do solution focus therapy, for example, for a seven, it's, it's giving cookies to a cookie monster. It's, it's kind of, <laughs> it won't work. I absolutely, you know. I remember in the graduate school I went to, it was all the methodologies were in psych school were very nine. They were trying to teach me how to be a nine. And I remember mm -hmm. actually going in the internship and I couldn't do it. And I felt terrible about myself. And I thought, I'm not a good therapist. I can't just sit here and uh, radiate unconditional positive regard. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I, so I even tried to fake it, uh, but when I started actually being a four, suddenly my clients started growing and sticking around, and they, there was a lot there. But um, even in the psychology world or in the coaching world, there can be this bias in what yes. you're saying. I agree with Sandra. Each profession has yeah. its own bias. Uh, and David Daniels and I were just talking about these kind of imbalances. Well, they, they can be in a team. Like if you work, I worked with a group of bankers and they were not surprisingly all what we call assertive style, uh, initiating style. They were like three, sevens, and eights. And they couldn't figure out why they kept going whole hog and getting a lot of energy going and then crashing. What they didn't have on the team was any fours, fives, or nines. Mm -hmm. They had one, nine. And they recognized there was no one there on the team who could just step back and go, wait a minute, guys, why are we going there and where are we going and so forth. That doesn't mean that they have, this is what I'm talking about. That doesn't mean we have to go hire a four or a five for that team. That is often right. not practical for them. Right. But then you get to have a creative discussion. Who on this team can wear that hat? Yeah, who would like to be the one who will take that task in the team and be that one to do that, even if we don't have somebody who is that type? Then we're in a creative play with this instead of just, you're that type, you're right. that type, you're that type, which is, I think, kind of 
Yeah. And, uh, and each venture, each that. project is potentially yeah. more successful because you've yeah. thought of all the huh. instincts, what uh, what needs to be considered, and it, the decisions are always better. Yes. You know, one of the things that I think that I can also share that we do with it is it's the greatest diversity tool that there yeah, is. Personality And diversity. so what happens yes. is, you know, we think of the four big diversity issues, but we go in and we talk, we talk about all of the diversity that's on the team. And you're right, many of the big companies that we work for use a Berkman or something to select out emotional types. And so what we come in, we see very few fours, unless we're in a design department, right. if you will. And so we can use that tool to teach diversity. We can use this tool, the Enneagram, to teach diversity. And it's, it's a wonderful way to do it. Yeah, I agree. You know, very early when we, I first started working in businesses, that was the term I used. It was, we were teaching personality diversity, and it was just taking the idea of diversity. They had already sort of figured out, okay, here's how we deal with you know, men and women or race issues, and now we're going to go even more direct and deal with personality typology issues. Yeah. Um, so in the interest of time, I'd like, if there's one person that would like to respond, one more response, and then I, I'd like to move on to another question. Is there anybody that has anything else they'd like to add, Catherine? I just want to say one thing that I do is when I give a code for our test for the company that I'm going to be working with, and I tell them that it's an open code for X number of days, and I encourage them to have anyone they want, friends, family members, take the test because there's much more engagement if they can take what they learned when I'm in the training and go home and discuss it with their partner or their children and they'll apply it and use it more. It's very different to teach the Enneagram in business. As we mentioned earlier, not everyone is there because they want to be. They're there because their team is there or their team leader wants them there. And many years ago I was told that it couldn't be done. We now know, of course, it can be done. And I took that risk many, many years ago and found the rewards to be invaluable. But we do need to modify how we say things. We need to simplify the language. We need to use it in the context of the business setting. We need to avoid anything that would put someone at risk with their uh, coworkers, their team members, and with their boss. So I have found that it's most helpful to really come from the positive and to support how each person can better understand one another. And the way David and I have done this is to use the Enneagram style questionnaire and then the Enneagram cards and tell the team how the person sees themselves. And if you don't use the Enneagram card system or you have another system, then it's still very, very helpful to explain the self-image of each member of the team. In business, one of the challenges is, as you said, people are often asked to be in the training. And here, typing becomes really critical because the Enneagram just isn't that effective without accurate typing. So I would suggest that anyone who's using it in business really get good typing skills. One of the problems in business is a lot of people will think, oh, I'm in business, I should be an eight or I should be a three. But really, all the types equally have powerful gifts to offer a team. And so it's, people need to know that to be successful in business doesn't mean that you're just one of a couple types. In terms of coaching, I think that what I find is so effective, again, is accurate typing. Because once you get the person's type right, you know exactly how to work with them and you can be much more effective and efficient. Um, so I would agree with what everyone has said. And amazingly, the Enneagram is now used in coaching and in business all over the world. Yeah. Our next question to our panelists is another very controversial question, but it's asked a great deal and it's quite a fascinating question, which is, does Enneagram type come from nature or nurture? Okay, the next question is a little bit of another difficult one. Um, and I would even argue up front that it's not even necessary to know the answer to this question, but it's asked all the time. And we may have different opinions, and I would just say that I have an opinion on this, but I don't know. But the question is, and you probably know what it's going to be, <laughs> does Enneagram type come from nature or nurture? Are we born our type, or does it come out of our environment and our family system? I have an opinion, I'll hold it for now, 
I'm curious just as to what your opinions or thoughts are. And I might ultimately argue that I don't know that it matters that we know. But it's asked all the time, and it was asked on Facebook again, and I've seen it many times. So anybody that would like to comment? Yes. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope well, I had the chance to answer it before those get yeah. did because <laughs> there, there are people here that really know something about that. Really, really know something about it. So, so we we uh, are <laughs> really compelled because of this incredibly interesting question. We did a study of identical twins and we had a control group and we were shocked yeah. that there are so few identical twins that were actually the same type. We went back and interviewed them all yeah, and, and again and it was like, well, I didn't want to be just like my brother. I loved him. And then we had one, for instance, said, this was my first date, this girl said. This was my first date, and the guy came over and gave my sister a big hug. <laughs> so there's the drive for differentiation is even greater in identical twins that are getting confused all the time. And we all have that, that drive. On the other hand, the identical twins were much more likely to be connected types on the Enneagram, related types than the random uh, pairs that we had. So it, it just fits. It, it's the both and thing, you know. That nur right. nature goes here one mm -hmm. decade, and the next decade it's an, it's it's uh, environment, nurture rather than nature. Right. It's a it's we're compelled to believe after this study, which was really a good study, that it's it's a both and deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and I, I want to go along with that. It is a both and deal. If you have more than one child, you know they come in with a different temperament. Mm -hmm. And that temperament is going to play on how we as parents interact with that child or how the siblings will, mm -hmm. you know, will interact. And so I think that makes a huge, you know, a huge impact. So we come in with a temperament, that's the nature, and then the nurture occurs once we start to interact. Mm -hmm. And once the relationship. I've got to add just one little quick thing. Remember that environment starts the day of conception. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the inner uterine environment is a huge environment. It's going to be different from one co kid to the next kid, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what, that's what the, the um, twin studies show, too. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Identical twins run in my family, too, and they have just what you say. They're, they'll be, one will be a five, one will be a seven. It'll, there'll be a connection as far mm -hmm. as the way the Enneagram is formulated, but they are clearly not the same style. And the, the other thing I would add is that a friend of mine one time said, well, uh, wrestling with this question, she said, uh, well, you know, I, uh, I'm a nine. I may have been born a nine, but I definitely learned to be unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I like the, uh, <laughs> somebody once said, well, which is, what's more important for determining the area of a rectangle? Is it the length or the width? <laughs> yes, yeah. it's nature and nurture. And, I, and Adler would add, the third dimension is the creative self. So there's something about freedom that also comes in that allows us to play around with the nature and nurture. So it's not we're completely determined by the two, <clears throat> but we have some say about it too. So uh, otherwise there'd be no point to learn all this. But I would say vis-a-vis -vis this, I'm very interested in the field of epigenetics, which is the idea of how environmental factors trigger the operation or the non-operation of genes is actually being studied. Mm -hmm. Genes yeah. express or don't express mm -hmm. according to environmental stimuli. So yeah, it's we live in a, it, this is really bad news for our ego, but we, as I've said many times, we're not a thing, we're a colony, we're a symphony. We don't exist as a self-enclosed object that we think, and nothing does. And I will argue, being a 468 tri-type that is <laughs> likes to be provocative. And this is purely opinion. I, I just have seen in my own experience, uh, and this is completely just uh, my own observation, and I think some with Catherine, she may disagree with me, but that when I was trained in uh, psych school, everything was nature. It was 100% family systems. And on a certain level, that was brilliant. And now with all of the brain research that's coming out, and having observed a lot of... Everything was nurture, you mean? Right. Did I you say said backwards? nature. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Everything was systems theory, and I loved it. And now, the more I read and study, it seems that, at least in my own bias, I'm swinging way the other direction, and maybe I'll come back to middle. But what I have observed so much with very young, even infants, as we have studied, like the work of Paul Ekman in microexpressions, or all of this research that's out on neuroscience and temperament, is that so much of it seems to be there, as you say, David, in utero, 
uh, pre-birth. So it, I don't know, but it would not surprise me if at some point they did realize that I was born a four. That's my bias. I'm happy to be wrong, but it's it seems that it's so early, this child's temperament, I can't see the trajectory that creates type because it would have to happen so quickly. And, the, and the essential self, too. We have to factor in what aspect is the soul's journey as well. And so we have nature, nurture, soul, individuality, different talents. Even identical twins can have different talents. I've worked with many sets of twins, and it, I've seen twins that were uh, different wings or a line of connection or right next to each other and totally different, identical. So it's always raised a question for me as well, that there's more we're going to learn, but that it's yes and. Nature versus nurture. This is one of the most debated questions. I totally agree with all the teachers. 28, almost 29 years ago when I learned the Enneagram, it was all about nurture. But as David mentioned, brain science has changed this and life experience has taught us otherwise. We have worked with children now from birth and watched them grow up to adulthood. And I now know many children that are 27, 28 years old, and their type was evident very, very young, or down to two types. With knowing what we know now in lexicon use, we can very clearly hear the words and see the body language and know even more than we knew many years ago. So now I would say that it's primarily nature. The key difference is that how someone responds, their ability to respond as opposed to react is the nurture. So I see it as a pairing of nature and nurture, but your innate instinct, your innate tri-type is nature. You are born with it. And how it develops is nurture. Would you say it differently, David? No, I wouldn't. I, I would agree with everything that you've said, um, and, and particularly the empirical research around the language findings. This suggests that this is a neurological pattern, that it's hardwired, and being able to look at the microexpressions of an infant yeah, and being able to see that this infant's microexpressions match the same as an adult of the same type, and then the person grows up to be that same type. I just don't see where there would be time to develop your type because we're able to see it in someone that's a baby. Um, so for our last question, we asked the panelists if there was anything that they wanted to add. And we're gonna go ahead and answer that question now. And the key thing that I would say is that my favorite saying is when all is understood, all is forgiven. Yeah. And for me, the Enneagram allows us to understand what motivates other people, why they do what they do. Um, and it ultimately is a tool to engender compassion and compassion for ourselves and compassion for other people. And for me, that's really what keeps me working with it. Um, I also, the more I've worked with this tool, the more anthropological it's become for mm -hmm. me, in that I see that the Enneagram is really a hardwired system. Um, and understanding that uh, has been fascinating for me. For me as well. In fact, I would say that it, it really is, is a matter of understanding and therefore forgiving, accepting, allowing, and growing. And that they're all related and that the more we can understand ourselves and others, you're so right, David, the more compassion we have. And understanding personality diversity enables people from different cultures that speak different languages and have different customs understand each other because a four is a four in Australia, in France, in Europe, in South America. An eight is the same worldwide. Each Enneagram type is the same. And if we can begin at the beginning and allow for personality diversity and honor differences, there is no limit as to what we can accomplish as a people and countries and as a planet. I agree, and one of the pieces that people often talk about with the Enneagram is wanting to do spiritual growth work. And what I see is that the Enneagram is so powerful as a tool to help you 
heal your ego, heal your wounds, get compassion for other people as you're talking about, that when you do that and you kind of clean up your own psychology and your own issues, which the Enneagram is incredibly effective at doing, the spiritual experiences and the spiritual awareness and the greater whole just naturally comes into yeah. play. Yeah. So I agree, it, it, all, it all stays together. I think that's why we've studied this for so yeah. long. Okay, so first of all, I wanna thank you for your incredible wisdom and insights. And we have one last question, which I wanna open up to each of you to essentially interpret however you feel called to do so, which is, is there anything that we did not ask that you would like to add in terms of the Enneagram? It could be something you're passionate about or what you do or, or something that you feel that needs to get out there that we didn't get to. So who would like to start? Well, one of the things that <laughs> I'm interested in, but I have absolutely no expertise in the area, is what uh, our EndNote speaker talked about today, the neurobiology of the Enneagram. I think that is just fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the uh, zeitgeist of the times. If you go in a bookstore, what you're gonna see is neuropsychology books. Change your mind, change your brain, mm -hmm. change your brain, change your mind. So it would just be fascinating to see <clears throat> what parts of the brain light up when the ones are working on a problem, two's working on a problem, mm -hmm. to see if it, what is the, the neurobiological underpinning of, of personality. It would be fascinating to see. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in, um, I, I suppose, bringing the, the Enneagram to therapists. I think that it's a wonderful tool that probably needs to be given away more to the uh, therapeutic community. Mm -hmm. Um, teachers too. I would like to, to introduce the Enneagram more to teachers, you know, so they could kind of learn that students learn in a lot of different ways, and um, work on my Enneagram test. To, uh, I might do that with uh, some other folks who who, who are doing some uh, assessment to see if we can get a good uh, online test. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll go. Uh, here's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about 35 year olds and under, and I'm passionate about getting this tool into their hands in a way that they can really, you know, embrace it. I don't want to, I don't want them to be as old as I was when I came into the system, or you. And uh, <laughs> and so I think. And so what I've what I've done is uh, I work with a team of people, and we've put together this incredible game, a video game that teaches. Uh, meditation, presence, it teaches levels of consciousness, and it does it by using the Enneagram. So I'm, I'm, I'm enthralled and passionate. Thanks. That one is easy to pick up because I'm the youngest one here. So I have to, <laughs> so I have to be the teacher on that. I saw that video program yesterday and I, almost. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I share that. I share that we could teach the Enneagram to young adults so, so they don't have to get in so much suffer and that we are all trying it. And, mm -hmm. and I think most of my clients is from 35 years and up to 60. And, and uh, because we, I think you have to have a part of a, an experienced life before you understand I have to look into this. And every single time I either coached or trained a young adult, and for me a young adult is younger than 35, it's about 25 or even less, they over and over again said to me, why didn't I learn this in the school? together. <laughs> yeah, I, I see my passions as almost a polarity. Um, <clears throat> but on the one hand, I want to explore more deeply uh, the roots of the Enneagram, mm -hmm. its esoteric origins. And I've been doing so, as uh, some of you know, in, in the e Egyptian mysteries, mm -hmm. how they found them their way into the Greek civilization as Hermeticism and Neoplatonism, how that got into early Christianity, Judaism, and later Islam. That interests me very much. And also the science is part of that too, which is another kind of esotericism, if you will. But I think all of that is because I'm interested, as, as, as you were talking about, in finding ways to teach and language this to people who, aren't, who don't necessarily think they're interested in esotericism. Mm -hmm to have them see that this is the concerns of their real life and that there are ways of talking about it that are in the metaphors and language of modern people, young people, people of other ethnic or religious backgrounds. Uh, I'm very interested in that, 
in broadening the conversation so that the demographic of the Enneagram world is reflective of the world. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, what comes up for me is that I think it's very important to um, do more research and because what I want to bring to the world is uh, yeah, knowledge that is true, that is that has a kind of foundation and that has a fundament. And But at the same time, I know it's only true at this moment with what we know now. So it's <laughs> always kind of, and I think there are a lot of books now, and, and even Russ, your books, the way you teach it now is different than what you wrote. Um, so I think it's always important to not just read books, but go to the trainers and follow up because it's it's evolving and it's not a uh, a system that stays the same. Mm -hmm. So and for me, it's like taking it further and and looking at new ways to look at it and research that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I'd have to say that the Enneagram is a a means to an end rather than an end in and of itself. The improvement of the Enneagram and the expansion of it and the cross, cross connecting with other models and uh, all of that is of interest to me and uh, proving it neurologically or biologically or in terms of a blood test or something like that, that, that all be great. But fundamentally, my bias and emphasis is on change, how to use it to change and grow. And the, the scope of that um, can take different forms, you know, what you're, what you're trying to do at various times in your life. And I would also second the um, comments about young people. Because so far, you, know, you come to a conference like this, it seems like the Enneagram is for old people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it's a very cool thing to know when you're very young. This is a life skill. It's something that would help you maneuver through a career and, mm -hmm. man, and mm -hmm. comprehend yourself and others in multiple ways. Yeah. Well, I, the, there's three areas. I would, first of all, I would second the thing about young people. But to me, one of the things is doing some research on that gets us into the mainstream science. And we've completed a study that's being prepared for publication now on the steps of development. And does any work with the Enneagram actually influence levels of development? And we have positive findings even at the 0.01 level, which is really significant. We hope to be able to have that published and break through that kind of glass ceiling into the academic world. The, uh, the thing that I'm though, passionate about is relationships. Ultimately, all we have is relationships. I'm passionate about love. How do we bring love to relationships? How do the Enneagram affect relationships and, uh, and love and, and, and change in that sense? So that's, that's, that's a huge passion for me, along with the neuroscience. We've also worked a lot in the last uh, group of us in the last five to seven years on the neurobiology stuff and the pattern machine of the brain and how we relate to what's called affective neuroscience. How do we relate to all other mammals on the planet? Mm -hmm. And the basic aversive emotions that we don't want to have but are very important. So th there's huge, but ultimately to me, it's about relationships. Thank you, David. I feel the same way. I, I want to see the neuroscience. I want every possible way that will engage more people in more ways to understand themselves and others. I, I love the testing. You all know I love the research. David and I do that together. And every time I think, OK, that's enough already, especially David, he said, you know, we have more data than we can possibly analyze. But then something will trigger one group that maybe wasn't interested before, and then we'll go off in that direction. Doing this show is just that, to get it out to others, to have more people benefit from it. And we, we so respect what every one of you has done and contributed in unique uh, contributions that are uh, just such a blessing to all of us. And your friendship and camaraderie and uh, being colleagues together and being here is uh, I'm deeply grateful for. Yeah, I would uh, second everything everyone has said, absolutely, and feel the same way you do. We, I feel deeply honored that all of you joined Catherine and I today. All of you I know are, one of the questions was how do we change the world? You guys are all doing it. Mm -hmm. So I know that's, that's happening, at least as much as we can. And I think in terms of my own passions, I feel like there's, since I first learned the Enneagram, I still am absolutely fascinated by 
uh, the patterns in Catherine's early discovery of the language research, I just blows my mind to this day to analyze 15,000 questionnaires on self-image where people handwrite in answers, and there's language cl clusters that are statistically, you can validate them. That just blows my mind because it says what we all experience, which is that this type expresses something that is so profound, yet it's still not quite who we are, as Russ talks about. And that, to me, maybe as a four, is endlessly interesting to me. And um, I love approaching it through the research. We were into the language research for you know, 15 years. We're now looking at the type visually. And it's amazing to me the patterns in the, what, the way the types look visually. But to me, it's always this reflection back to, wow, if that's this pattern, then where is the soul? Or who am I that's not the same machine that I see some in another form? And wanting to get that out there, I just, I personally find that just, it's, it's been a liberation, like, I love your word, David, to see that and to keep refining that model. Mm -hmm. So it just, to me, it's like, just, it's like sharpening a sword. It just gets stronger and more powerful. Um, my other personal passion is we recently did a training on Enneagram and spirituality, and that was, uh, I love doing it and really trying to look at the difference between what is personality, what is your temperament, and what is your soul? And can we even look at those as different things? And if we do, or, or even if you don't believe in the soul, what is your inner observer and what is this Enneagram type? And splitting that out. Um, I love online internet stuff. That's a big passion of mine. Doing the testing instruments. Um, you know, I love bringing the young people in on Twitter and Facebook and our Facebook page. And um, They're so inquisitive and curious and I like meeting them online because that's where they are. So I think, you know, ultimately it's, uh, I see that it's, I think we're all going exactly the same place, which is that we want to help people grow and build their relationships and feel better about themselves and be happier and healthier and have a deeper presence and awareness of what's going on in their lives. So I just want to thank each of you deeply. Thank you so much. Uh, many of you have been teachers of mine for long periods of time in the past, and I thank you for that. And I thank you for joining us today as colleagues. And um, I really look forward to, to getting this out. I think it'll mean a lot to a lot of people that you all did this. Yeah, I was just going to say that. You guys, what incredible contributions you've made uh, to the Enneagram. And thank you for having all of us.